everybody. Welcome to Virtual Hoop Dreams episode one. Uh, this is a new series. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be updating you on all happenings within basketball gaming. Uh, of course, some big news, you know, is NBA Live back? News about Scott O'Gallagher returning to EA Sports to work possibly on a new NBA Live game. I'm here with my special guest, Hardcore Gamer. You know him from the NBA Live community, served as an EA game changer. I'm here with Swaggy P. Lino. Hey, man, once again, it's an honor to be here, man. Uh, I'm absolutely ecstatic for what we have to talk about and to projections as to what to come for the future in regards to our virtual hoop dreams in consideration of NBA Live and possibly 2K and the possible analysis of having two competitive games in the basketball gaming mm -hmm. market for options just is an outstanding, outstanding uh, interpretation on the state of basketball gaming. So I, I am excited to be here for the show and thank you for having me, man. Yeah, I can't get much more exciting than this. We have 2K21 on the horizon, um, you know, for PS5 a couple months down the road. The official release for NBA 2K21 is September 4th, so we have that going for us. The Scott O'Gallagher and Rob Jones announcements, et cetera. Um, you know, for new listeners, uh, I've also been a passionate basketball gamer, hardcore basketball gamer since the early 90s, just like Swaggy P. Lino. I'm incredibly active on the NLSC. Um, I... Um, co-host the NLSC podcast with Andrew Begley um, every week. That show comes out every Sunday and we also touch on everything basketball gaming. So definitely tune in to that as well. Um, Please do. Yes. <laughs> that's a lot of fun to record. Andrew is incredibly knowledgeable. Um, he's one of my good friends and he's been doing it for such a long time. Um, and before we get started on talking about Scott O'Gallagher, what I want listeners to understand is that there's no bias here. Swaggy Pilino and I, we want one thing. We want great basketball games, right? Oh, we yeah. want <laughs> games where people are going to create memories. They're going to have fun. I don't care who makes the game. It's about getting great basketball games in people's hands in order to make memories. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly with that. And the reason why I, you know, support the NBA Live series as passionately as I do is because I recognize how important it was to have, you know, options in basketball gaming and how that actually, you know, supported the culture. Um, and it's always a benefit to have, you know, options because options, in, you know, helps competition and competition is always a great environment to spur innovation. It's, it's a natural motivating force. So to, to have this potential option to come back um, to us, um, it's the whole basis as to why I supported NBA Live. I did not want, I don't want NBA Live to go away, never wanted it to go away. Um, and I'm glad that there's a possibility that it may make a strong, you know, comeback. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it's not a bias. It's, it's about encouraging and bringing back those wonderful memories that we had in the 90s where we had multiple titles out there on the shelves and we enjoyed them all you know, equally, because they had their own interpretation and own style um, that resonate with us in love of uh, basketball. So no. yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, absolutely. Thousands of memories with my two brothers playing uh -huh. basketball games. That's why I'm so passionate about it. Uh, we laugh, joke about it, talk about it all the time. We have basketball gaming weekends still, et cetera. And like you said, you know, we used to have a lot more options. Um, you know, used to have the NBA in the zone series, the NBA live yeah. series, the NBA 2K series. Um, you had, you know, games like NBA Starting Five, and then in the early 2000s, you had NBA Inside Drive, and you had mm -hmm. the NBA Shootout Series, and yes. you just had all of these options. Um, and then, you know, recently, you know, Live hasn't released a game. They didn't release one in live, for Live 20. They're not releasing one for Live 21. Um, so what we'll get into a little bit later is our hope for release of lot for live 22 and how and how that could be possible so the first thing i wanted to get into was who is scott o'gallagher um some people may not know i had to do a little bit more digging um in order to research more about him myself uh, so basically scott o'gallagher and swaggy p lino is more familiar with him than i am but um i got i i became more familiar with this research scott o'gallagher um 
who worked for EA Sports from 2012 to 2014 as a producer, developer, and designer, has um, announced his return to EA as a creative director. He, and he did this on, um, on Twitter. He had worked for Visual Concepts and on the NBA 2K franchise for, for the last six years or so um, as a gameplay producer. Um, and, and something that I didn't know, I didn't know how storied his basketball career was as a player. And that gets me excited as well. And we'll get into that in a minute. But Scott also had a storied basketball career as a player, playing professionally in Bulgaria, Macedonia, Turkey, New Zealand, and Australia, while also having a storied high school career with Gresham High School and a college, um, a gifted college career with Warner Pacific. Uh, Warner Pacific. And I was looking, his New Zealand stats are actually up online and stuff. He averaged 16, 17 points per game. Um, I believe he went to a title game when he played for Macedonia. So he has a storied basketball background. And why don't you tell us, Swag, how that's going to help, you know, the NBA Live franchise as somebody who's going to be a creator, creative director for that game? Yeah, you know, throughout the multiple years, one thing that I've always wanted for NBA Live was a recommitment to the game of basketball. I, I believe that they, you know, kind of strayed away from their sense of going with the mindset of making a genuine approach to make a simulation basketball title with firm basketball concepts and principles. And although heavily scrutinized, you can see here there's NBA Live 14. I observed great conceptual ideas that were perfect, were in good alignment with the foundational reestablishing of going back to trying to make a simulation aspect of basketball game. And we had good core signature play, um, not just with the playbooks, but with the animations and consideration, the, var the variations upon um, player interpretation, especially with the technology of bounce tech that he brought um, into that franchise. So although the game suffered significantly on a graphical level, um, I look beyond that and look at the root, the seeding that is there that could have blossomed by now if they would have stayed the course. And Scott O'Gallagher had a vision that was in relation to maintaining an NBA standard with NBA Live. Um, NBA Live has successfully brought an environment of fun. There's never been... Um, a period in which someone did not have fun with the game. NBA Live 16 was the first evidence of that with them introducing a more arcade street style of game, which resonated well with the community going into 18 and 19. But what has been lacking is their true core principle of basketball. And, and our community has been begging for that. And this is why I'm so ecstatic, so happy that Scott O'Gallagher with his story basketball history, with his knowledge of the game in conjunction with knowledge of development that has grown through the years, brings some promising foundational signs for me that NBA Live on the next gen will be an eye opener. Man, how do you feel about this, man? Do you know how many times on Twitter, on social media, I've seen it on the NLSC as well, on Operation Sports. Do yes. you know how many times I have seen people say they need to get people as, you know, either creative directors or developers or whatnot with the series that have a true basketball background? People yes. that truly know the game, either played it, coached it, just know the X's and O's, understand basketball to its core. Um, I've seen these complaints over and over and over again. And that's also one of the excuses um, that people make for the live series. It's not an excuse, but kind of like a, they kind of attack it that way. They say, well, they need people that know how to play basketball, right? right? They know the game. They played the game. They know the game down to its core. So like you said, you know, what gets me excited about it is, this is one of those guys. Yes. This is one of those guys. And he combines that with his experience. And, you know, um, you know in development and as a, as, a, um, as a developer, as a gameplay producer and all of that. So, I, you know, something that I, I loved, and I think this is from an article from Steve Noah. I know that there are a couple of these comments are from an article from Brian Mazik as well, who, as people know, he works pretty closely with NBA 2K. This says, okay. O'Gallagher was, uh, was a devoted gamer at a young age, playing a mix of consoles growing up. He remembers leaving his Gresham High School football coaches in a fog while discussing 
Dreamcast during water breaks. And one of his quotes is, I've always been a huge gamer. All of my old friends will know I was either playing basketball or I was on the sticks. Mm. He said, Tecmo football, that's what got me hooked. So this is a guy also that appreciates and was around for the rich history of NBA Live. He was around for when NBA Live was actually on top. And he was also around to, like you said, play all of these different titles. He had exposure to a time when there were so many different players in the space and, and he knows how beneficial that is for the basketball gaming industry. Absolutely. And, and, and to, to have that rare perfect synergy of someone who actually played the game and who now knows um, development as well is a perfect opportunity for NBA Live to, to have a resurgence here. Um, making basketball gaming um, a very dynamic environment. But the, the point that you've made in regards to Scott O'Gallagher, absolutely on point. Um, it's, just, it's just very important that you have a, a firm basketball reference there um, that will help support the development of the game to make it as genuine and as authentic as possible. And you can't have a better reference than Mr. Scott O'Gallagher himself. Um, you know, Sean O'Brien for multiple years was that reference. He also played collegiate basketball and had a passion. And, and there were other developers there that are still there that have that passion as well. Um, you know, I got to talk, you know, to Connor Dubin who's been there for multiple years. As he, um, Ryan Santos, JC Delanoy, a passion software engineer and who's very um, dedicated to his service. Uh, and some of the new developers that came in, you know, Tim J. Robinson, Shout out to Project Lee, who's no longer there. Um, you know, Malik, Timothy Schwally, they have this energy for basketball, but we always worried if EA was really committed to that energy. But now you have this cementing here with bringing in Rob Jones and bringing in Scott O'Gallagher that gives us an, uh, an indicator of hope that there is possibly this recommitment to make a genuine attempt to produce a simulation basketball game with some of their aspects of playground basketball that they've maintained through the years that they kind of, in my opinion, not re they did not reach perfection, but they reached an, an area where they have an environment where players can have um, a walking experience, um, um, onboarding experience, so they can build their knowledge of basketball and grow to that simulation aspect. I, that is my projection, but we'll see if it'll come into fruition. Man, right, and, and we'll cool. touch on and we'll touch on Rob Jones in a section in a second. But I wanted to bring this up um, real quick before we move on. Is I also host the um, Holding Court with D for Three podcast, which covers real hoop. And you brought up the international basketball scene, like the the passion, the, the yeah. passion from the fans. And one of the quotes from um, Scott O'Gallagher is, and uh, he said, uh, there was a timeout and I got hit by a tomato on my way to the sideline one game. He said that, you know, in the article, it says that international crowds tend to run on the passionate side. O'Gallagher remembers playing a road game in Turkey and hitting a corner three that iced that victory. And he turned and flipped his jersey in a bit of showmanship. And I think that's when he got hit with, uh, with the tomato. But we just talked about that on the Holding Court yeah. podcast. So. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, you cannot beat the passion of those fans. Um, it's more than basketball. It's pride um, for everything that you represent in regards to to the country, and and to to grow up in that environment. It's just it's just an immersive um, experience. So Scott O'Gallagher wanted he knew the the importance of bringing an immersive basketball game and experience to his fans because he immersed himself in the game in actuality, and he did a, um, an astounding job translating his natural experience onto the virtual experience and. Yeah, it's <laughs> you. You can't beat that. You honestly cannot beat that, D. Uh, and 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 I hope um, the executives work in perfect alignment and accordance to his vision, and give him the autonomy to create a basketball video game that will literally, um, possibly redefine our basketball gaming experiences. Yeah, fingers crossed. And, you know, you brought up yes. NBA Live 14, you know, one of his, um, one of his signatures, um, no pun intended, one of his signatures is the, um, how he worked on that dribbling system in yes. NBA Live 14. And I remember 
revisiting NBA Live 14 and I sent a tweet about this and I actually talked to you about it in a chat as well. And I said, the thing that stood out to me with NBA Live 14, in my opinion, it wasn't a good basketball game. I'm going to be completely honest to people. Like overall, it didn't have the depth that needed to. The right. animations overall, as far as shooting, going to the rim and stuff, were very, very robotic, right? Yes. They didn't really feel natural. But the one positive that I gave about that game was I said, hey, you know, the dribbling feels pretty good. Like <laughs> right. I, I enjoyed the ball handling um, yes. on that game. And that was something that, Scott, um, Scott O'Gallagher, from my understanding, took front and center stage of being in control of. Yes, yes. That was, you know, I was very happy when NBA Live announced their comeback with Live 14. Um, so I wanted to support the series in hoping, in, in, in the hopes that this game will continue to grow and blossom and bring back that environment that we mentioned in the beginning of the show where you have options and considerations um, for basketball gaming, spurring innovation, spurring, uh, spurring uh, uh, the motivation to progress every single year. And, and that was the experience that was most profound to me was the bounce tag. Um, and it was a shame that most people um, did not mm -hmm. have the incentive mm -hmm. to go deep into that aspect of development. And, 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 and I did, and, and I had some of the greatest experiences just playing around, just dribbling the basketball um, and seeing the differences amongst each character. Um, and like you said, although it was relatively rigid, um, I knew the concept and what it could bring to the NBA Live series. And it was my hopes that they would, like I said, just stay the course and just continue to build. Um, and you saw even more of that in NBA Live 15 as well. It was starting mm -hmm. to get a little mm -hmm. bit more improved. And then at that moment, he, you know, Scott O'Gallagher left. Um, but yes, that was that was the most complimentary experience for me in NBA Live 14 with the bounce tech, and I think everybody would agree with that. No, sure. absolutely. I, I, and but the last thing I want to say too, before we go on to Rob Jones, real quick, I understand, and I, if for anybody from EA uh, listening to this, and I've talked with um, Andrew about this on the NLSE podcast as well, I understand that there's some passionate people that work for development on the NBA Live series over the years. I completely understand that. And I understand that most of the reason why there's been poor releases, especially over the last 13 years or so, is because the suits have not been truly invested in the series. They haven't right. given the proper resources. They haven't promoted the game properly, which we're gonna get into in a little bit. So anybody who's listening to this from EA Sports, who really does have that passion for basketball, has the experience, has a vision and all of that stuff, and you were held back by, you know, the suits and stuff, I, 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 I'd want to let you know that there are people out there that get it. Yes, absolutely. 110%. Um, and I, we all understand that it is a business. Um, we understand that, you know, more pouring of resources is relative to the amount of success that you get, especially with your return of investment. And, and we know the dynamic that takes place when you go to the, to the table um, in those executive meetings and you lay out the guidelines as to what you want to do with the franchise. And, you know, they simply say, uh, well, we cannot provide that unto you because of this magnitude of loss or that or whatever may be the course. In spite of all that, I want to, in this age and day and age, I just want to express gratitude, which, which may be daunting to some, and particularly I don't care, because I want to be thankful to EA Sports that at the very least they did not, they did not give up in NBA, on NBA Live, that they continue to try to make investments to provide whatever they could, even though they suffered significant losses throughout the years, to provide some type of a gaming experience to their consumers. So even though NBA Live 14, 15, 16, 18, there was a, a bleak of a moment of hope there. And then 19, um, although they did not experience the level of success, of success that we wanted, I still appreciate the matter that they, it existed and that there were developers and producers there who shared passionately their efforts to try their best to make the game that they wanted for their community with the resources that were afforded to them. And I would like to thank Andrew Wilson as well for committing to the franchise and say, you know what, we've lost this year, we've lost this year. I'm, I'm gonna stick with it until we figure it out. I'm gonna build a studio in Madrid. I'm gonna maintain the studio in Vancouver. You know, I'm gonna keep EA Tiburon open for NBA Live. 
Um, and, and I'm just going to keep at it until we figure this out. So um, although as community members, you know, we suffered the ups and downs, we suffered the cancellations, we suffered this and that. It was all in consideration to, for the hopes to go back and reset and try to make something good for the basketball gaming community. Hopefully this may be the case. We'll see. Now, again, fingers crossed. I, I want to point something yeah. out about NBA Live 19 too. You remember when NBA Live 19 demo came out? I was uploading a ton of yeah. gameplay. I, was, I even uploaded a video that said, this game is so fun. Um, yeah. I'm very picky about basketball games that I play. Um, they hurt the game with patches. They hurt the shooting. It yes. became sluggish. Um, they they patched, They overpatched the game, which happens a lot nowadays. 2K does the same thing, and they've hurt some of their releases as well. But I was also streaming at the time with NBA Live 19, and the you know IGN gave it a seven plus on rating on their review. I believe um, Gamespot also did the same thing, and other outlets. There were there was some noise about it. There was some yeah. positive feedback. They have a little bit of a, you know, they had a base to work with. The animations overall felt smooth and clean. You saw the feedback on those videos that I uploaded yeah. for NBA Live 19. The feedback was fantastic. People are like, hey, I'm gonna get live this year. So they I created something. There's obviously some knowledge there. There's obviously some passion at EA Sports. Fortunately, they ruined it with patches for the most part for me yes. anyway, but yes. there was something there. And that also gives me hope because their most recent release, there was some substance. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and let me just go ahead and uh, tap into what you, what you mentioned about NBA Live before the actual release. And that was the experience that we were having at EA Play. And, and it was, and it's just really unfortunate that the majority of the community uh, community members were not able to physically play um, the model that they had at EA Play. I mean, there were actual considerations of um, of not just uh, improved player movement through, uh, I forgot the name of the technology that they uh, they say, oh, real player motion. It was actually there in effect. There was variety of speed interpretations between big man, guards, small forward. There was also De defensive considerations you know for example i bring up this example all the time uh, with my experience with fly guy gbg we played against each other i was the Celtics. shout out to you d43 <laughs> and i was and he was the rockets and you know you know that gordon hayward versus james harden is a legit mismatch yeah we know gordon hayward does not have the greatest footwork defensively at times he can't be a defensive liability and this is exactly what happened at EA Play, I and, I and I I got burned by James Harden through Fly Guy GBG in the first half consistently. Then on the second half, I had to strategically move my players. So I put Jason Tatum out there on James Harden instead. And I and I was able to compete much more effectively. And I said, wow, this actually matters. And then they dropped the patch right before release and it went truly back to this arcade kind of style of format, not committing and remaining committed to that real player motion that added that differentiation of player movement between big man and, and small man. And, and then the big men had strength at EA play. Um, you could see them taking advantage of guards. They were not being boxed out by um, point guards. They were being pushed under the basket. Those principles were abandoned. So yeah, like you said, there is some knowledge there from the developers to create a simulation aspect of basketball. Um, but once again, when you go to that table and you go to the executives, if it doesn't align with their vision of what they believe the community wants, they, they the developers are forced to scrap that and create something else. And, and, and that's literally what happened with NBA Live 19. It was unfortunate. Those are all facts. And, and, I, and I'll point this out really quick. Um, the problem is, is that there's a lot of people out there that say, well, NBA Live is arcade, or they're trying to be arcade. That's not a simulation game. For those people that, try, that say that, you have not been paying attention to what they've been trying to do since NBA Live 06. They have had games that came out of the gate that were even kind of sluggish 
and even kind yeah. of slow, like NBA Live, um, I, I want to say NBA Live 08 and NBA Live 09, where yeah. the controls were a little bit clunky and they tried so hard to get like a realistic feel, like a, like a simulation feel. But there's people out there that hang on to this belief that NBA Live wants to be more arcade, that NBA Live doesn't want a sim basketball game. But when you actually look at the last decade plus of games that they've released, they have been trying to go in the sim direction. And nothing can be more proof than that too with NBA Live 19, with NBA yeah. Live 19's pace, with the way um, they tried to make dribbling feel, with the way they tried to make it just an overall more sim basketball experience. So I just wanted to crush kind of that whole statement, that rumor that, oh, NBA Live is arcade. They always make arcade games and stuff like that. They're trying to be sim and those developers are trying to develop sim and you know that. Yes, I do. Because uh, in spite of the narrative that was being provided by by most, I always investigated and looked for items in Sim because I was one of the rare players who played offline, which is the root of NBA Live when you talk about its history, and even 2K. Before there was online play, you had the root of just pure gameplay offline. And that's where I would find some of my simulation experiences with NBA Live, although minor at times, because you really had to look under the hood you would see what the developers were trying to do and what they were trying to create and how it would blossom over the years if they would remain committed to that. One of the major complaints that, complaints that we had as a, community, as a community is we would notice some aspect of Sim that would be great. And then we would be puzzled the next year as to why they, they would re remove themselves from that. Uh, you know what I mean? You know, it, it did not seem as if they had a clear cut vision as to what they wanted to do. But every year there were some aspect of sim. For example, NBA Live 19 has a very good introductory, very minuscule, but introductory um, aspect of freelance offense. You have the 32 high, you have the 41 low, you have the 41 corner, you have the 32 corner, you have the five out. And if you mastered their elements of execution, you would see what they were trying to do, bringing that into the table. Shout out to Timothy Shawali and the others who helped to make that happen. So yes, there has been a commitment there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that you need the proper backing to support that commitment on a consistent level. And, 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 and it takes two to work in this synergistic um, mindset to commit to this cause, not just the developers and producers, but also the executives of EA to come into this perfect constituency of agreement to say, this is what we're going to do. And it looks like this is the case right now. Yeah. Efforts, efforts, a big part. Effort plays yes. a big part. Um, and I'll just really quick before we move on to the next portion. Um, so Scott O'Gallagher, and this is an article by Steve Noah, um, Scott O'Gallagher leaving NBA 2K series for creative director role, creator, creative director role at EA Sports, joining ex NBA 2K senior producer Rob Jones. So I just want to give a quick rundown, um, real quick of Rob Jones. So this is more experience added to the team. He has been, um, he's listed as a senior producer for visual, a producer for visual concepts, but has worked with visual concepts since January of 2001. So it was January 2001 to September of 2018. Um, he's been working on the NBA 2K series for that long. Um, prior, he worked for EA Sports on the Madden franchise from 1995 to 1999 as a producer. So really quick, again, more experience <laughs> added to the team. Um, and it's much needed experience and hopefully they're coming in hungry like they're coming into working for ea sports again and they're like you know what we're here with a mission we're here with a purpose and we're going to make a great game oh man just a mere speculation that that conversation is being had right now as we speak excites me beyond measure yeah you might not see it physically but mentally i am ecstatic because this is all i've ever wanted this is all we've wanted as a community was those who have that mind, that commitment, that dedication, not just to the game of basketball on the virtual hardwood, but, you know, the game of basketball in general, and, and, and not just the present, but the past as well, which you are very firmly passionate about, which I love. And it, to see those um, pieces being implemented into an otherwise talented developmental team that really did not have the same resources that visual concepts provide to their developers, uh, it just... 
it, it, it brings a, a, a flicker of light <laughs> for the NBA Live series. And it also makes me want to speculate that there could be this NBA Live could probably be the greatest NBA Live experience we've had uh, since NBA Live 10. Go how ahead. Can I not be, how can I not be passionate about basketball gaming when it's brought me so many positive memories? How can yeah. I not be passionate about it when it's something that my two brothers who I love to death, who mean the world to me, it's one of their great, their favorite things to do now. And it's been one of their favorite things to do for the last 20 plus years. You know what Absolutely. I mean? So yeah. um, I, I care greatly about basketball mm -hmm. games coming out. Um, any basketball game that comes out, um, it just means more possible memories, um, cherished memories that I get to create with my family. And, uh, and whatnot. So absolutely. And, and last thing point before the next session is Q asked a question on NLSC and he brings up a point that somebody that I've seen actually on Twitter. Um, he said, uh, you know, he seemed talking about Scott Gallagher. He says he seemed really enthusiastic about the job as most people would be uh, when he got it. But did he really do anything of significance when he was with EA? And I want to make a point about that. He was not with EA for very long. No, he, he was also new to the basketball exactly. gaming scene at that point as somebody working mm -hmm. in it. Um, he was a player for a long time, but he was also some, um, somebody new. Um, he, was, he was responsible for my understanding for the dribbling controls in NBA Live 14. I don't know outside of that what he was um, responsible for as far as like being a creative director or producing or developing or anything like that. So I have a positive outlook on it because his first game that he worked at it on with NBA 2K was NBA 2K 15 and NBA 2K 15 was an awesome release. NBA 2K 15 has great gameplay. Like I go back and play that game and it's tight on the controllers. It's really good gameplay. So I do want to answer that. If people have that question, you know, what did he do with EA? He was new to EA. He was working on the dribble system on NBA live 14 and he wasn't with them for very long. Right. Exactly. Right. Well said. Thank and you. I would elaborate further upon that answer, but you nailed it in the head. It was literally his first developmental experience after experiencing the real life hardwood playing overseas. Um, he wanted to come into NBA Live and fulfill a vision. Um, he had a clear vision, not just with dribbling, but also with the implementation of how he can make the game more sim. Um, and unfortunately, you know, things didn't work out. And, he found a better environment with visual concepts and he remained until now. Yeah, absolutely. No. And, and I think, um, I think the, the thing is, and I'll just move on because I know you have to go to work in a minute. Um, you know, what does this mean for NBA live? Are we going to get a release on PS5 and, and all signs point to yes. Um, I had shared this with you, you know, about a month ago on, um, they posted, um, on job sites and on their main site on EA sports, dot com um i'm not exactly sure the url but yeah you get it it said yeah. they posted for a community engagement specialist position contractor and it literally says nba live it's for yes. nba live and i've seen a couple other positions related to nba live on there i believe as well so the bottom line is they are working on something related to nba live meaning we will and we're going to get a release on ps5 at some point that's mm -hmm. the way i look at it possibly hopefully for nba live 22 what do you think the odds are that we get um that they've already been working on the game and that's what i think's been happening they already have the, the studio's already been working on the game putting all the pieces together getting used to that ps5 tech and whatnot what do you think the chances are that we get an nba live 22 um literally 100 percent, and I, i'm not saying that um <laughs> I'm not saying that as a fanboy. I'm being genuine here. Um, it, it was a letter that was written by Andrew Wilson stating that their focus would be purely on next gen. And, and based upon experiences that I've had with the developmental progression of NBA Live moving forward that, um, that I cannot really mention, I, I can literally guarantee to the community that they are actively working on NBA Live. And, and that is a genuine, true belief, unless Andrew Wilson states otherwise, which is always that possibility, you know, because he is the chief executive. Um, and if he decides to pull the plug on a particular project at any moment for any reason, that would be the only exception. But other than that, I can assure you that they are definitely working on this game and they've been working on it for a while. So, right. Yes. And, and that's why I had to jump on here. 
right? I was like, you know what, this is super exciting. We haven't had a NBA Live release the last couple of years. The last one was Live 19. Obviously, there was no announcement for this year. And I'm like, oh my God, they're coming back. And I said this on the NLSC podcast when I was talking to Andrew. I said, listen, there is absolutely no way with no other competitors in the space that they're not going to come out with a title on this next gen. Like there's absolutely no way they're not going to give it another shot. So I was pretty optimistic even before the Scott O'Gallagher thing, um, you know, in the Rob Jones thing, I was very optimistic that we were going to be getting an EA sports basketball title at some point. So, you know, the next question is, is what does EA sports need to do with NBA live in order to be a true competitor in the basketball gaming space? And obviously part of this is learning from your mistakes, making NBA live a priority, making sure that they invest the time, money, resources, all of that into the title, which how can you not do that when you will be the sole competitor for NBA 2K? You're not competing with all of these other companies. You have one person to size up excuse me, mm -hmm. one company to size up right now that's making a five-on-five -five simula um, simulation basketball title. So um, one, I, I, I made a, a short list, but I'll go down that really quick. So number one for me, gameplay needs to take center stage. It has to feel good on the sticks. It has to give a great first impression. And when I mean that, I mean, even with the demo, it has yeah. to give a great first impression. It has to feel like fun. It needs to have less bugs, less heavy feeling of the players, more loose feeling. Um, people want to have to be able to look forward to picking up the stick. So gameplay needs to take center stage. Yes. Uh, I was going to say continue with the list because you are, those of you who know me know that my primary focus has always been on gameplay um, because that's the first thing people see. Um, that's the first thing they experience. And then they go into the options of modes and the various ways in which they can enjoy the title. But if that initial experience with gameplay is not there, then there's no incentive to buy the product or even invest any time in it. Matter of fact, if they experience one to two bucks for the NBA Live Series, you know that there's, there's a zero tolerance policy with the community because of the negative stigma of their um, history. Um, being compounded upon the current experience. So even though the bug may be minor, for example, it may be minor in 2K, it's major in NBA Live, especially for their consumers, because they meticulously evaluate and painstakingly look at any potential issue. So if the gameplay is not there, and if it doesn't resonate well with the community, it's pretty much a wrap uh, for that moment, unfortunately. But, but yes, absolutely. Gameplay, first impressions, you nailed it, D. I'm just echoing your statement. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, and I, I want to point this out because you brought up running plays. When I think of running plays, I'm thinking about the average gamer who's going to run plays and play the way that you're talking about. They need to be able to appeal to gamers like you and then gamers um, that only pick up the game once in a while or are not fully in tune with basketball or they just want to pick up, maybe run a quick play now and then etc right. you know maybe a quick post up maybe they're going to run floppy or something like that they're not going to run the 32 high and all of that stuff they need right. to appeal to both when it comes down to that the gameplay the core gameplay the mechanics of the game the engine of the game needs to be fun and it needs to be reactive it needs to be able to appeal to both and it can because we've seen titles in the past that have been able to do that. So there is a way to appeal to both gamers, but the feel is just so important. Number two, basic depth that has a focus on the NBA. You know, I, I can't say this enough. People love basketball and a major part of that love is the NBA. And, you know, I've said over and over again, you know, because of the lack of depth, not having retro teams and all of that, um, people aren't getting their NBA fix with NBA Live. Right. And they need to put the NBA back into NBA Live. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, that's, that's the part of the game that the community has been looking for because it's stated in the title. And a matter of fact, there's been members of the community say, we're not going to commit to uh, NBA Live, just take the name NBA out of it and, commu and commit to a street form of basketball, um, which discouraged me greatly. But there was some rationality in the claim, because if you have the name in there, you have the license 
you have the rights of ESPN and you have the capacity to make investments to provide a simulation basketball title based upon the agreement that you have with the brand, um, then you should make a concerted effort to provide that to your consumers. Um, and yeah, it, it just was not there in its fruition It'll, in the magnitude of which we would reach a point of basic satisfaction. So that has been missing and hopefully we can get that back. Absolutely, and I think you would agree, um, paying tribute to Retro, the classic NBA, I know they did a classic yeah. NBA, I know they did a little bit of that um, with um, court battles and whatnot in NBA Live 19, but you know, people need, need more Retro, they want more classic. Um, they, yeah. they, they want more classic NBA, they wanna be able to use those players and teams in offline mode. Even, and I said this, you know, just because something is an older idea doesn't mean it would work now. You know, even right. if it was bringing something back like all time teams, bringing back a legends pool to, for starters, doing yeah. something outside of ultimate team and outside of court battles where people can move these retro players around. They, and you know what's gonna happen if they end up doing that and they end up investing in the depth and the retro depth and everything? People are gonna be uploading videos on YouTube. People are gonna be promoting the crap out of that content. And mm -hmm. that is just more people that are gonna be talking positively about the game. It's going to be more people that are going to be promoting the game and buying the game and whatnot. So it is, it is vital that they add, you know, some retro depth. They, they touch on franchise mode and make it multi-user so you can use multiple teams. So, you know, to give people a more immersive um, My League franchise, whatever you want to call it, you know, dynasty, um, dynasty experience. Absolutely. And they can be even more innovative by creating a street level experience where you have you have an opportunity to play against some of these NBA players in a timeless fashion. And, and I appreciate the origin of the one and what they were trying to do. But what was missing was the true authentication of those um, type of players that existed out there on the streets, like the Dr. J's um, at Rucker Park and the Kobe Bryant experience at Rucker Park. Um, you know, the, the Steph Curry's at uh, Keys Art Pavilion, like having those genuine experiences, what was missing was having the actual player replication there, you know? So, you know, there's an opportunity there to be super creative to where you can go to different eras of the playground and experience these legends on the street level also, because that's what they were trying to do. Um, so there's multiple ways of interpretation to pay respect to the retro aspect of the game because um, you'll be educating young players upon these important um, these important players who existed before their time, you know, before what's going on now and giving them a gaming experience that, that will just blow them away would give them that respect. So I'm glad that you brought that up um, because like you said, they tried to do it with Live 16, Live 18, Live 19 through their prom experience. It just wasn't quite there because you didn't capture the essence of the player and its gameplay. So now they look like they might have the opportunity to do that now. Thank you. Authenticity. Um, and, and before we move on, you know, having size ups in NBA Live 10, we get all the way through NBA Live 19 with no size ups. Right. Size ups was a, was a portion of authenticity, right? Yes, it also seemed like dunks ended up becoming more generic. You would hop into Ultimate Team and you'd have legends like Clyde Drexler running down the floor and they couldn't dunk. Remember, they had to do an Ultimate Team patch. So, yeah, nice. you know, you had these, these issues where you would jump into Ultimate Team and there wasn't a proper representation for these legends um, or even, you know, even the regular players in the league. Like yes. I, I talked about, if, you want, if you're using Kevin Durant, you want to feel like you're using Kevin Durant. You don't want right. Kevin Durant to feel like Pascal Siakam. Right. You want you want to have a difference between those players and things like size ups and signature dunks and and slightly different movement and all of that stuff that adds to the immersion and get immersion and gets people talking positively about your game. Uh, the last portion of this, and I, you'll definitely agree with this. We've talked about this off air so many times. Um, marketing, market your oh. game. Get out there on Twitter. Talk to people on all different social media past, um, platforms. Don't just start. Don't don't just talk to people on Reddit. Don't just listen to influencers. Be out there. Promote your game. Talk about your rich history, which is mainly between um, '95 and 2005. You know, promote the NBA Jam get series. 
right? Yes. You know, right. market the heck out of your game and get people talking. NBA Live should be in everybody's living rooms. It should be in everybody's heads. And this silence on Twitter, on social media in general, the silence, even just recently, they haven't, the EA Sports NBA Live page hasn't made a post in months. Yeah. Um, you know, the silence is deafening. Promote your game. Yeah. Yes, you are absolutely right. And, and you're in an age where that can be easily done. Um, I do social media. Yeah, it's absolutely. That's literally free marketing. Um, the brand will market itself as well. I, I really like what they did with the marketing for NBA Live 18 um, going before the release of that game. I thought it was an outstanding marketing strategy. It wasn't great, but it was good. But Live 19 marketing was actually even, even slightly better. Um, but what we need is engagement, con constant engagement, constant updating, constant uh, constant reminders that we still exist, um, giving them progressive items of consideration here and there, um, you know, making the community feel a part of the game instead of making them feel as if they're separated away from it. So having that inclusive approach to where they're not just playing the game, but they're actively participating with the community and with those who create the game. 2K has done an outstanding job with that. That's how look they look at the lives. Yeah, that look, look at Baluba, like you know, putting yes. out Twitter polls, and he's talking to people about the shot meter and about the size of the shot meter. Um, yes. And for those, you know, Mike Wong, um, you know, he's talking about the size of the um, shot meter. He's asking people questions about the game. He's answering questions in the comments yes. on Twitter about the games. Dazar is talking basketball. Yes. on on Twitter and whatnot. Chris Manning, who's a hardcore Lakers fan, he's on yes. there and he's talking about the Lakers and he's talking about, it, there's been times where he went on there, I believe, and talked about like schemes and stuff like that, that teams were using. And he's talking about his passion for basketball. They need passionate community managers. And I've said this over and over. There are, like you, you know, there are people out there that are true students of the game, that love the game's history, that would do anything to promote NBA Live and be that positive source in the community. Um, look at the loyal fan base. Look for people in that loyal fan base. And um, I, I'll say this on here. I don't care if anybody thinks I'm playing favoritism. I think you would be a great community manager, but they need people like you, um, like Andrew Begley and whatnot, like Rock, who are passionate about basketball gaming and will engage with the fans and promote the game. Uh, you know what? I, I do genuinely appreciate that. You know, one thing that I do love is whatever I experience, I want everyone else to experience because I have such a level of grat gratitude and thankfulness, you know, for being able to participate with the game and also, you know, play the game and share those experiences with everyone else. So how, how I'm uplifted, I want everyone else to be uplifted um, with the experience, even if there's people who's fighting against um, you to, to not do so. Um, you would make a, an outstanding community manager. I'm just gonna be very honest with you. Thank you. 110% because of your knowledge of the game retrospectively, your ability to analyze the game at its current state, to do effective comparison and contrast of not just the state of basketball and actuality in the real life hardcore, but also on with your extensive history with the virtual hardwood as well. And, and as to Andrew Bigley and the NOSC, Man, they were my number one resource before I started to uh, participate in community engagement with NBA Live, which was not my original intention. I just was passionate about the game and I wanted to support it at all costs and I did not want it to go away. That's why I would extend myself to the uh, NBA Live's Veterans Committee. That's why I would extend myself to the NBA Live movement and of course, under my own Twitter handle and trying to bring more people in because I recognized that there was a community who did not want NBA Live to die because they understood the importance of not just having NBA Live around, but why it spurred innovation and competition when they both existed and, and why we need those options. But it is of my genuine hope that you seek that position um, as well because you have literally all of the pieces in place. Um, to do I, you don't have to say that. I, no, I appreciate that. I, I want to point out about Andrew really quick. Andrew and I have done about 40 episodes now oh, of yes. um, the NLSC podcast, which we discuss everything basketball, gaming, current retro, current events, all of that stuff. 
And, you know, we record for almost two hours, um, sometimes over two hours every single weekend. We release a, a show every week. And the work that he does over on the NLS LSC real quick, um, the work he does over there is he, he, I mean, he's writing articles every week. Yeah. He's paying um, tribute to retro. Um, he's being the moderator as well on the site. Um, he is a hardcore collector. I, I, he has basically almost every basketball game, video game ever made. Yes. Um, <laughs> the fact that he hasn't been reached out to, to be a game changer or to be involved in promoting the game, he would be so good at promoting the game. He would be fantastic at promoting the game. The fact that that hasn't happened is incredibly disappointing to me. And I hope that something comes through for him at some point. Not that he's ever asked for it. It's just, he deserves it. Um, I, so, would love, you know. I really would love to see Andrew Begley, you know, even if he's not existing in the front of promotion, but to be active an active hardcore, I'm talking about a very consistent, active participant upon the stages of development for the game. You know what I mean? On some magnitude of that level, because when I listen to his podcast, which I've been doing for years, you know, I was there literally from day one. Not, I wasn't a contributor per se, but I was a consumer of his information, of those that would put their opinions under his forums, the articles that he makes every Monday and Wednesday on a consistent mm -hmm. basis. I wouldn't always comment, but I would see it and I would read it. And it would also spur innovation and ideas within me um, to have him to be an intricate part of the developmental process would also help to cement um, uh, my confidence upon the establishment of the next NBA Live installment. If I was to see that, I'm like, oh, yeah, we're there. Imagine Scott O'Gallagher, Rob, you know, uh, what, what's his name? I'm so sorry. He, uh, is it Rob? I, I don't want to say Rob. Is Rob it Rob Jones? Jones? No, I just want to make sure. Rob Jones, Andrew Beagley. Um, you have intricate members of the community, and then you also you also have yourself. Um, man, we would have. Listen, I have high hopes. I, I have high hopes before. regardless. I'm just happy we're going to be getting a game. Um, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so the last yeah. thing I want to do because I know you got to go to work, um, and we uh, I don't want to take you away from that. So I want to do a quick thing on NBA 2K21. As we said, we're not biased gamers. We're not, you, you and I are not, you know, we don't just play a game because it's made by a company and then crap on another company. Like, that's not what we do. Um, I want to go over quick NBA 2K21 releasing on September 4th. I've already pre-ordered it. I order it every year. Um, I did a demo impressions video that I recommend people checking out. Um, it's about 34 minutes long. I kind of dive into the differences between 2K20 and 2K21, um, you know, should people buy NBA 2K21, what I expect on the PS5 and whatnot. Um, so really quick, what were your impressions of the NBA 2K21 demo? And what do you see possible pitfalls being with um, the reception of 2K21? Well, with my initial impressions of 2K21, and this would be a preliminary one, considering that it's only coming from the demo, um, I would have to agree with most when they talk about the movement. The movement is just not there. If I would have to rate the movement for 2K, um, which has been suffering for, for some years, um, out of, you know, from a scale from 1 to 10, it's pretty close to a 6.5, almost, you know, like around that mm -hmm. level because mm -hmm. you see the, the inconsistencies there. And I've, I'll, I've already identified a bug in the demo at 2KU. If, if you receive the ball at the top of the key and you try to do a, 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 a hezzy step back, not, well, not, I don't call it a step back. I mean, I can't say it per se, but if you press R2, or right trigger and down on the right stick, you'll see him do like this glitch that will literally kind of make you out of control and will take you into the backcourt. Just, just the mere fact that you have those kind of issues for player movement shows to, that there is a significant issue there. I, I, I do like the shot meter. I, I thought it was different. I, I like the skill um, um, there for those who want to compete on that level. I do like the, that implementation. Um, but I have issues you know, with the, the, the way acceleration is executed in the game. Uh, and I touched on that pretty at length. Yes, as far yes. as like the speed breaks, oh. the acceleration, yes. the clunky change of direction, the way it yes. feels to switch hands with the dribble. stuff. Right. Like yeah. And then the feel is just not all, all there for me, um, in, in, in my opinion. Um, there's times where the feel 
of the player is outstanding. And there's times where it's like, whoa, wow, wait a second here. Um, you know, um, if they don't address those issues before the game is released, um, the reception of the game might not be as stellar as we expect with this um, installment of 2K21. Um, um, and, and that was the one thing that was highlighted to me. And I noticed community reactions were quite similar to, similar in regards of that consideration and gameplay. Um, and for me on that preliminary level, that's pretty much my true concern there for uh, 2K21. But your video pinpointed some issues that, and that I didn't even consider that was well stated. And I recommend that those of you that are in this channel, if you haven't seen it already, please do because um, there is a, some significant items of discussion that to be had there based upon your evaluation and an analysis of the game. For sure. Thank you. Um, I, I think um, real quick, you know, the positives of the game, um, shooting, as you had just mentioned, the shot meter is better. Um, shooting, do, even though I play with the meter off normally, I didn't have the option to turn it off. Um, shooting does feel a little bit tighter. It feels a little bit less rushed. Makes a little yes. bit more sense. Um, skating isn't as bad as it was for 2K20, but it's still there. Um, you don't get the same sense of just gliding down the floor. You feel like you have a little bit more control, but again, they really need to work on the foot planning for PS5. Um, there's um, passing has improved. Um, you can now actually outlet without the ball sailing over your, your teammate's head. Um, yeah, you can do absolutely. realistic outlet passes um, off of the rebound, which is the legacy issue that's been in the game from, you know, basically since the PS3 days. That's been right. just there for, for a long time. Um, I think that where the game, and there's less two-man animations. That's a big one. I feel like there's a little yeah, bit less. Good. You have more freedom around the hoop. You're not getting sucked sideways, backwards um, into defenders and whatnot, forcing you to miss. There's not this crazy amount of missed layups that you should hit, et cetera. Um, the shot stick changes will work for some. They won't work for others, but you can turn it off. So there's no reason to really get too upset about it because you yeah. can go back to the old way of playing. Um, as far as, you know, issues, there's just, there's constant dropping of the ball for no reason. You know, yeah. body steals, picking up your dribble for no reason, yeah. uh, et cetera, which is super frustrating. And again, as we talked about it, the player movement, you know, I asked in the video, do these people move like human beings? And yeah. <laughs> with their with their with their speed breaking constantly um their acceleration breaking the herky jerky movement their head bobbing um all of this stuff you know the way it feels to change direction um you you feel like you have not only a lack of sense of control but visually it's appalling it doesn't look yes. like human movement. Um, yeah. So I, I go over that in the video. I definitely recommend you checking it out. I do want to say one last thing as far as NBA Live, um, you know, as, as far as them competing goes. NBA 2K, especially since 2K18, has ra ramped up the microtransaction BS mm. to an all-time level um, to the point where there's gambling mechanics in the game. Um, the people are spending an absurd amount of money on release just to get their player up to a overall where they can be competitive. You know, they yeah. want to be able to be competitive with their friends. They want to be able to enjoy the game. And the only way they feel like they can do that out of the gate, gate is pouring more money into the game. One thing that NBA Live needs to do when they return is be the anti-2K as far as microtransactions go. They need to be the exact opposite. They can have some sort of system in the game. And you know there will be where people can, you know, upgrade their character faster and all of that stuff. But they need to be more lenient with it and they need to be more need to be more fair to the gamer and that alone will win them a lot of consumers it, i call this the perfect storm because they have a system there in place with the one um in its manner of execution that is already pretty good if you look at most community responses to those who are even um the, who are not even frequent users of NBA Live who, or who have experienced NBA Live for the first time are very positive upon the reception of the one. The only issue that we have here is what you've mentioned with the number one aspect of your list is gameplay. They need better genuine authentication of signature basketball and more items of expression and analysis in their player creation system. Once they deliver that, that is going to compete very well against the park. Imagine NBA Live with a strong, positive reception in their gameplay experience, and you have the, the 
already onboarding experience of the one. And you're able to create magnificent players that looks true to life, that that moves, like you said, human beings that that you, you can break down and apply various aspects of signature to that structure. And you don't have microtransactions. You can see a huge migration coming over to MB Live because you know if you're coming from 2K into this brand that you're going to also have a very good experience or potentially outstanding experience in which you don't have to invest in additional funds to compete in a, a gameplay experience that rivals the competitor. So, wow, that potential alone is huge. So the one, although small now, is huge when you think about the gameplay corrections that they can make a development that will equal 2K in creation potentially there it is. That's all it takes. There's so much opportunity. When yes. You see it. It's it's and that's why I wanted to jump on here. There's just so much opportunity. It gets you super excited. Right. Yes. There's so many different things that they can do in order to grasp a gamer's attention and turn that perception around. You know, Scott O'Gallagher made that post on Twitter, and all of the comments that streamed below him were just like, Oh my god, I'm so excited. We might get another NBA Live. The fact right. that people think NBA Live is dead or that people won't pick it up if it comes into the space, that is the biggest bs lie that oh, there cool. is yes. people just want a basket they, they want a basketball game they want a fun basketball game if they can make memories with it and the game looks good they're going to pick it up and exactly. that's just the way it is and you know that as well as i do um yeah i I'm, I'm i'm super excited you know for for anybody else um you know as far as if you enjoyed the show this is being uploaded to YouTube. Um, this will be a series, but it's not something we're doing every week. We're going to jump on here when we want and do an episode like we did here. We had to do an episode um, yes. with this with this news. Um, but, you know, maybe we can get some other people to join us. Maybe we can get Rock on. Um, I know yes. that Andrew's expected um, expressed interest in having you on the NLSC podcast. Maybe we can get him over here on Virtual Hoop Dreams. Um, if you guys like the show, though, Nothing is greater than feedback and Swaggy and I both want to know what your expectations are. Do you think we're going to get a, an NBA Live 22? Do you believe that Scott O'Gallagher and Rob Jones joining the team is a major sign of improvement and that we're going to get the basketball title that we want? And what do you think that NBA Live needs to do in order to actually be a competitor in the space? And I also want to know, does this help increase your confidence in EA? to to make the right decisions um because you know with what's going on with madden and the way the executives are viewed i wonder if this helps to bolster their confidence that you know ea might be taking the course to go back into the direction as to what is originally stated in their mantra it's in the game and and based upon the actions that they've taken with us mba live right now what it looks like in its most preliminary assessment it looks like they're making that commitment to going back to it's in the game at least for nba live and if it works out for NBA Live, if they stay true to that commitment, then of course it's going to be a contagious um, effect upon all their sporting titles. So this is huge, man. This yeah. is huge. I, I'm I'm excited. Um, so definitely let us know in the comments. And um, as I said, if you liked what we did here, you want more, let us know. But you know, until next time, thanks for tuning in, and fingers crossed for NBA Live. Absolutely. Thank you, Dean. It's been an honor.